Welcome to Mikon's Hardware. This video is going to be about this gigantic Intel S2600 dual socket Intel LJ3647 motherboard. These motherboards are not very common, but sometimes you can find them on eBay for under 300 euros, and that's a very decent price if you actually need this motherboard. So first of all, let me briefly go through the specs of this motherboard because it's really lots of cover. And if you want a detailed specification of the motherboard, please just go and study the Intel PDF manual. Starting with the obvious, we have two places for CPUs and 16 memory slots. Eight memory slots for each of the CPUs, but because LJ3647 CPUs have only six memory channels, it is optimal to install only six memory sticks per CPU. This additional black slot on each side of the CPU is an additional slot for the same memory channels. So on two of the memory channels you can have two DIMMs per channel and on the rest four you can have only one DIMM per channel. Then, just like with LJ2011 version 3, where Intel made two different versions of the same socket mounting, with LJ3647 we have the same situation. We have a narrow socket and we have square socket. Intel S2600 ST motherboard uses a square socket, so this is very important when you are buying a CPU cooler, because the narrow mounting is not going to work here. In my case, I was lucky enough the motherboard was sold with the two Intel coolers, so I did not have to bother with cooling, and these coolers are native for this motherboard, so it all worked out of the box. But if you're buying just the motherboard, make sure that you are buying correct CPU coolers for your motherboard. Now let's move to the other half of the motherboard, because over here we basically have just CPUs and RAM. PCI Express slots are very plentiful here. We have PCI Express X16, 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 X8, 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 X8. And this additional one that looks like PCI Express X1, this is actually not a PCI Express slot at all. Instead, this is an additional slot for some sort of management or servicing of the motherboard. So do not try to install PCI Express X1 cards into this slot. Additionally to the PCI Express X16 and X8 slots, we also have two M.2 slots. The top one over here is PCI Express 3.0 X4 and the one at the bottom is PCI Express 3.0 X2. So you can install two NVMe SSDs over here, but the top one gets full speed of X4, the bottom one gets only X2. And if that's not enough, you also have four Oculink connectors. Each of these four Oculink connectors are PCI Express 3.0 X4. So you can install additional four NVMe SSDs if you would want to. These weird connectors are fan connectors. So if you're having some sort of a server with this kind of fan connector, they are natively supported. Otherwise, you can use here four pin PWM fans. Then in this corner we have a USB 3.0 header for the front panel and additionally we have an onboard USB 3.0 port. Over here we have two standard SATA 3 ports, but additionally we have here two slim SAS connectors and each of these connectors can be split into four SATA ports. So in total we have 10 SATA ports, two over here and eight over here. The front panel buttons and LEDs are getting connected to this long connector. The connector is not a standard, but you have schematics over here. And of course, you can read very detailed Intel PDF manual to figure out what to connect where. Intel S2600 ST is a proper server motherboard, which means it is equipped with IPMI. And in this case, we have SPEED AST2500. With IPMI you have full remote control of the motherboard through the Ethernet adapter. So on the rear side IO you have two network jacks, an additional network jack which is connected to the IPMI and you can connect through the Ethernet, open a web page and have full remote access and remote control of the motherboard. Here it is important to mention that if you want to have a remote desktop you need to enable the onboard VGA. 
if you install an external graphics card, the onboard VGA will be disabled and the remote control will not work. Um, but if you enable it manually in the BIOS, then the remote control kind of works, but the mouse navigation doesn't work because it is messes application between your external graphics card monitor and the onboard fake monitor. Now let's talk about some fun. Intel S2600 ST has a TPM 2.0 connector and according to the Intel manual the TPM connector must be 12 pins. And indeed on the motherboard I have a connector that has only 12 pins. Nevertheless, if I go online and search to buy a TPM 2.0 module for this motherboard, using the part number specified in the Intel manual, I see only 14-pin TPM connectors. This is very frustrating and very annoying. I even created a thread on the Intel support forum and none of the support agents and so-called Intel engineers would know what's going on here. They would come up with all sorts of explanations and all sorts of excuses just not to solve the problem. Uh, what we have in the reality is that the Intel's manual says that the connector has 12 pins. Uh, my motherboard indeed comes with a 12-pin connector, but if I search for TPM module according to the Intel part number, I get 14-pin modules which are physically incompatible with this connector. So, after a couple of hit and miss purchases, me and Bias I Engineer managed to get our hands on a 12 pin TPM 2.0 module so Bias I Engineer could check the schematics and develop his own TPM. Right now, on my motherboard, you can see a pre production sample made by Bias I Engineer because the original TPM 2.0 from Intel is just way too expensive. For my sample, I had to pay almost 100 euros, and surely enough, I sent it back immediately after testing it with the motherboard. And this is a perfect place to mention this video sponsor GLC PCB. I have used their services to produce PCB for all the TPM modules. So, for example, you can upload a Gerber file and you will instantly see preview of your PCB from both of the sides. GLC PCB will also automatically detect how many layers you have and what are the dimensions of your PCB. If this is a prototype batch, you can select 5 PCBs and use Hassle with LED for prototyping and that would cost you just $2. But if you want the final batch, let's say I want 100 units of these PCBs for Machinist X99 TPM modules made with NIG, that would cost me only 27 US dollars. What I also really like about GLC PCB is that they are very flexible with shipping, starting with DHL Express for very urgent orders and then going down to Euro Paquette, which is my favorite option. All my GLC PCB orders were placed before they decided to sponsor this video, so I have paid with my personal money for each and every order. I can confidently recommend GLC PCB as a quality and budget-friendly alternative to some other famous services. Even though this video is mostly about Intel S2600 ST motherboard, I have also done some benchmarks using two Intel Xeon 6148 CPUs. Before I go into the benchmark numbers though, I would like to mention a few important things about this motherboard. First of all, what strikes me is the quality of the motherboard. Everything is done very well, the PCB is very thick and very stable. Then, this being Intel motherboard, in the BIOS, by default, we have microcodes for all sorts of CPUs. Of course, I cannot guarantee compatibility with every possible CPU, but for example, my CL CPUs, such as 6268CL, would not work on my Supermicro X11 SPI TF motherboard, but the CPU works out of the box with my Intel S2600 ST motherboard. So if you have some questionable CPUs and you want to check if they're working or not, you can try to run them on this S2600 ST motherboard first and then move on to Supermicro or some other motherboard. Now a few annoying things about the motherboard. This is a server motherboard and it takes ages to boot because it needs to initialize and start up IPMI, then it needs to check every memory module, identify what's working, what's not working, and only after that it boots. In my testing, from start to Windows, it takes up to 3 minutes, which is very long compared to desktop computers. 
On the positive side, I can say that the motherboard is able to identify faulty memory sticks and if one of the memory sticks is not functioning correctly, it will just disable that memory slot. It will indicate that in the BIOS that the memory stick is installed but it is faulty. You will also get an LED indicator on the motherboard which of the memory sticks are faulty. This is very handy if you need to debug and especially when we keep in mind that the motherboard has 16 memory slots. So if the motherboard does not boot up just because one of the memory sticks is faulty, it would be a nightmare to take them all out and insert one by one. Another annoying issue is that we do not have fine grain control over the smartphone and memory timings. Uh, yes, I understand that this is a Surrey motherboard, but I would still like to be able to adjust the fans the way I want. Right now we have either performance mode or the quiet mode. And in quiet mode, the second CPU would overheat because the heat from the first CPU goes straight into the cooler of the second CPU and the motherboard would not ramp up the fans. Instead, the CPU would just start to throttle itself to keep within the temperatures. If I enable the performance mode of the CPU fans, then the system is really noisy. Surely enough, we can replace the fans with something quality from Noctua or Be Quiet, but that's gonna be a bit challenging, because these CPU coolers are non-standard, these are server units, and all in all, I would say the motherboard is not a good fit if you want to use it as a workstation. Finally, let's take a look at some benchmark numbers of two Xeon Gold 6148 CPUs. Each of the CPUs have 20 cores and 40 threads, so in total we have 40 cores and 80 threads. And as all of you know, when you have two CPUs, your frame rate is magically doubling because you have double as many cores and double as much L3 cache. So let's go straight into gaming. Assassin's Creed Mirage and we immediately can see how great two CPUs are for gaming. Yeah. Two 6148 CPUs score about 8446 FPS, which is lower than a single 8124M and significantly lower than i 2697 v3 with the Turbo Boost Unlock. So for those who did not understand my sarcasm, dual CPU systems are really bad for gaming. If you're looking to play games, then you shall avoid any dual CPU configurations because these kind of systems are really made for specific workloads where you can run multiple different tasks at the same time and are not made for gaming. Avatar Frontiers of Pandora is yet another example why you shall not game on two CPUs. All other CPUs tested would produce about the same result, about 90 FPS minimum and about 115 FPS on average, but with the two 6148 we get only 78, 105 FPS. So even in this game we managed to get lower result than expected. CS2 or Counter-Strike 2 is probably one of the worst results I have got, 65, 124 FPS. Can you play with such FPS numbers? Yeah, sure, but why would you bother if even i 2697 v3 with the Turbo Boost Unlock is able to deliver 101 206 FPS? The last game is F1 2023, and unsurprisingly, two 6148 are taking the last place yet again 159 222 FPS. If i 2697 v3 with the Turbo Boost Unlock is able to deliver 216. 295 FPS. As you can see, the difference is massive. Dual CPU systems are really not designed for gaming. The synthetic benchmarks shall be more favorable to the dual CPU systems, and in Cinebench R23 we can see that two 6148 score almost 30,000 points, compared to 26 core 8272CL that scores about 25,000 points, it's really not that much. We can see that Cinebench R23 is not really scaling up to 40 cores and 80 threads. Thus, if you do not plan to run multiple virtual machines or many different containers that would execute their individual tasks, but you just want to do some Cinebench-like workloads, buying this many cores also doesn't really make much sense. 
Cinebench 2024 results just confirm everything I just said. 26148 score about 1600 points, while 8272CL that has only 26 scores scores about 1453 points. As you can see, 26148 with a massive 40 cores can't really beat 8272CL that has only 26 cores. Geekbench 6 is more of a suit of different benchmarks and it is a kind of single thread biased, so 26148 are not impressive here either. In single core test we have 1243 points and in multi core test we have 11562 points, which is significantly behind 8272CL that comes with 1454 points and 13129 points. The last synthetic benchmark, Blender Open Data, is the one which actually sees benefit from the two CPUs. Here, 28148 score more than 500 points, while single 8272CL delivers about 400 points. The gap is not that big if we consider the core count difference. 26148 have 40 cores and 8272CL has only 26 cores. But still, this is the biggest gap by far. The scores and the FPS numbers are just one side of the story. We also need to take into account the power consumption. First and foremost, this dual socket system at idle consumes about 100 watts of electricity. And very frequently, when the system does something in background, the power consumption spikes to 150 and 200 watts. And this is without any load. It's just to keep your system with the two CPUs and 12 memory sticks idling. So, with that in mind, you won't be surprised to see how much power the system pulls when under load. During Cinebench R23, entire system consumes about 412 watts. And during gaming in Assassin's Creed Mirage, entire system sucks from the wall about 520 watts. That's like really bad. In terms of efficiency, this is pretty miserable. Uh, we have only 0.28 FPS per watt. While E5 2697 V3 with the Turbo Boost Unlock, which is very inefficient, delivers 0.4 FPS per watt. This is all because 26148 are delivering very bad gaming results, so power consumption results in very little FPS. At the same time, Cinebench performance is not that bad actually. We get 72 points per watt, which is slightly better than 8124M that delivers about 70 points per watt, and it is significantly better than E52697V3 that delivers only 54 points per watt. All in all, what I can say, if you have some sort of a specific workload that requires multiple virtual machines or multiple containers which are doing different tasks and doing these tasks all the time, then Intel S2600 ST would be a good platform to build your server on. Right now, there's a Xeon Gold CPUs like 6148, 6138, 6150 and similar are going down in price significantly, plus ECC registered DDR4 memory is also very cheap and you can stuff lots of this memory onto the motherboard. In all other cases, there are better options. For example, if your server is mostly idling and not doing any computationally heavy tasks, then idling at 100 watts is really bad. Also, if you just need one task to be executed quickly, you don't need 40 cores and 80 threads for that. At the moment, I do not have any use for this Intel S2600 ST motherboard, so most likely I will be selling it. If you're interested and you have a use for the motherboard, drop me a message in Discord and we will figure something out. With this I have to say thanks for watching, thanks for listening, I hope it was interesting and see you in the next video where I plan to test dual socket LJ3647 motherboard from Huanan Zhi.